Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Tennant Nicholson. I'm the president of the Henderson County Beekeepers Association for the year 2023 and the year 2024. And I have the distinct pleasure today to introduce an interview for you, Antoine. Antoine, and I'm going to uh, make sure I say your last name correctly. It's uh, Ignizio. Very good. Somebody took oh. phonics. Yay. Okay. So Antoine is, um, he manages our apiary at the historic Johnson Farms. And I just wanted to make sure that all of our members in Henderson County and other beekeepers around the world um, actually can, can get contributed to a little bit from his brilliance on YouTube. And so that's why we're doing this. So the first question is, I want to know, Antoine, why did you become a beekeeper to begin with? Well, it was a gift. <laughs> so, so I got a uh, B-School as a gift and I went ahead and I was enthralled. Uh, as a child, I used to catch bees all the time in jars, never had a clue as to where they came from. And this was in Staten Island, New York. So a city kid who, you know, if you had woods, you were great. So we had woods when I was growing up and uh, caught honeybees on what is now ragweed. That's how we know, because I know it now and uh, loved insects and it was just a lot of fun and bee school when that came into play it was such uh, an eye-opener and uh, I had a, a fond love of biology when I was growing up and through high school and college and I really enjoyed the heck out of that so it just gave me a, a, a taste of what was an immeasurable amount of information to learn and require and send you down numerous paths which you never envisioned. And why did you become a member of the Henderson County Beekeepers Association? Well, um, as Henderson County uh, established Bee School in 2006, it actually came about the history of our, our club. Um, was It was affiliated with Asheville at one time, the Buncombe County Beekeepers Association. And that was prior to 2004, I believe, when Bee, 2004 or five. Oh. Okay, so okay. it split off and Henderson County became its own entity and that was during the days of Jack Painel, who was our bee inspector prior to Lewis Cobble. Oh. And Stuart Van Meter, who was the first president of our club, it kind of, I have a little side history as to how it all came about, if you want to hear about it. Sure. So, so Blue Ridge Technical School, before it was Blue Ridge Community College, had a couple of hives out there. And Jack oh. Hanel was the bee inspector or the state agricultural uh, inspector. And so uh, Stuart had uh, interest in that as well. And he spoke to him and they were having an issue where the actual hives the two hives at the time were located. So there was a, a, a woman named Ingrid who is I think up in years and still alive and was an employee of the Johnson farm. And through a lot of political wrangling and uh, pe knowing people, she was able to get a piece of turf on Johnson Farm for those two original hives. Is that and right? That's how that came, came about. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Stuart, uh, because he was uh, the, one of the innovators, along with um, uh, Marvin Owens, who was part, who is Terry's predecessor, uh, Terry Kelly's predecessor, um, and Terry Keller which, Kelly is the person at the extension office who assists our club. Correct. And so Marvin and Stewart combined, along with Jack Hanel, established the Henderson County Bee Club at that time. And so in 2005, I believe that was the official first bee school. And then I took it in 2006. And we had David Stallings and a number of other former presidents who actually came to the ranks later on. And later on, Jim Poe, about two or three years later, came through school. And then my affiliation with the club grew only stronger when I actually became a beekeeper in 2012 because I, I was still working full time at the time. And I was a, a working for the U.S. Postal Service as a letter carrier. And 10 hour days didn't kind of jive with being a beekeeper. Thank you for your service. Appreciate that, man. Thank you. <laughs> so that's the brief history. So essentially after 2000, after it was established in 2015, we had change in leadership, David Stallman, David Fody, and they wanted to incorporate the apiary in some manner or form as part of B-School or make it better. And so that happened gradually and uh, likes of Chris Armand, Jim Poe and myself, we made that happen. 
And that lasted about a year in 2016. And then uh, uh, Chris and Mott had to depart and uh, for personal reasons. And Jim could, was taking on more functions within the club. And so it fell upon me and Padma and Will Reddish, Padma Divine and Will Reddish came in with me and we kept it alive and it was going to be disemboweled. So the apiary was no longer going to be in existence. And I said, no, that, I'll, I'll take it up. And I already had the experience in working in there. And so in 2017, 2016 and 17, I was working with, together with Jim and Chris. In 2017, I took it upon myself and joined by Padma and Will, her husband. Uh, we have brought it to fruition today where we have a, com a complete staff now working together, which is uh, uh, Christy Boone and her husband, Alex, um, <clears throat> Mark and Susan Haver, Gary Clemens, and um, uh, Padma and Will. It's so funny because, you know, I, I, so last night, you know, we were having the bee social once a month and last right. night we were at the brewery locally, uh, Akla, uh, Aklawaha, um, mm -hmm. I think I said that right, brewery. And so I met him and then um, Gary, I remember because the year that I volunteered to get the, uh, to put on the barbecue, he got all the buns. This <laughs> <laughs> That's right, he did. He was right. telling about so, that. Like <laughs> So we all have like a different, you know, uh, perspective. And I do remember, um, you know, when I went through B school, um, there was, but Shane somewhere was in there too, was it? Because Shane was like demonstrating something that I saw. Was he just kind of doing some, uh, then a demonstration under you and Padma then probably? Shane, Shane actually came upon and, and volunteered many hours of service into the apiary as well and has become a vital part. He was originally the vice president of the club for a short period of time. And gotcha. so Shane got into being there. So David Stalling, Shane, uh, David Fody, myself, Jim Poe, uh, a number of others who are in and out of the club uh, currently made this club what it is currently and they thank you, you know, so much re, yeah we reconfigured a lot of things and again one of the goals I had as an individual in the club is to make the apiary a working compilation of all the stuff that goes on in B school plus to be a support network for both the community and beekeepers to shed light on all the things that can and will go wrong at some point in a beekeeper's uh, lifetime, That's but sure. also to practice within the apiary and the confines of the safety net of that, where if you muck things up, it's okay. That's, and then, but you can take home viable information that you can utilize immediately in your own apiary and having questioned the other mentors or participants who come to these sessions to gather the most information that's practical and within North Carolina beekeeping standards for best practices. That's our goal. It's a, it's a really simple mission statement because I believe these are creatures created by God. They're already perfect, okay? Our position is to keep them alive and be good stewards. And that's animal husbandry. It's really great. So, and I, I just wanna, I'm gonna share the club's website so you can see where you can find when the apiary is actually in existence uh, for you to go over at Historic Johnson Farms and to, once you've been through B-School, you wanna go through B-School, and then you can actually volunteer or take a demonstration or learn at the apiary. But I wanna just pull up a few online resources for um, everybody. So give me just a second. Okay, so here is hcbeekeepers.org is where you're going to find monthly updates to the, uh, the club and the apiary. So. You can find information about the apiary in our newsletter and the newsletter is right here at the beginning. And then um, down at the very, in, like in the middle, you're gonna see apiary news. And then this information here is where the team that's actually working at the apiary will update you. There's one other place all the way down at the bottom, the calendar of events, uh, where we're going to have information uh, about apiary, right? Especially like when it's the season, you know, weather permitting and special events and, and whatnot. But you can also find last minute information on our Facebook page, Henderson County Beekeepers Association. It's a private group. As long as you answer our questions, you do not have to be a member to join this group, but we do ask that you um, answer all of our questions to become a participant on this private page. 
So with all that said, what are some tips that you have for, um, let's, let's do your top three tips for new beekeepers, your top three uh, tips for intermediate beekeepers, and then maybe the top three tips for advanced beekeepers. Great question. Okay, so great tips for beginning beekeepers. Yes. One, one first and foremost, have a mentor. Uh, success for a beekeeper, especially an introductory beekeeper who's taken bee school and has been overwhelmed by this insurmountable information that we've given you, it will come together more cohesively when you have a mentor. So the first tip, a mentor to go into it with the perspective that you have to be proactive about everything because bees are natural creatures who are going to do what they do best and it's reproduce which means swarming okay or dying because they were neglected and three as a beekeeper your responsibility is to try to understand and be a good observer of what is going on under colonies. So a lot of times we tell our beekeepers, you, you should you know, make weekly or bi-weekly inspections. I hesitate to say to do that on a regular basis because you do disrupt the mo mojo, if you will, of the bees inside their colony. So I say, make, make yourself a great observer. So for three tips, proactiveness, mentor, and a good obser observer okay. to see activity. All right, Mixed. intermediate. Let's look like, intermediate beekeepers. Okay, intermediate. So we call them beaks for those of you who are just watching this and you're maybe a want to, a wannabe beekeeper. Uh, beekeepers, we call each other beaks. So the bee crowd out there, you know who you are. <laughs> the bee crowd people out there. Those are the people who've got probably one to two years experience. Now they've found that what they've stumbled on. So you have as an intermediate recognize when you have made a mistake not to repeat it okay so okay. you will so don't so one don't repeat uh don't repeat mistakes okay correct understanding is still with your mentor if you are a second year beekeeper it doesn't mean you don't need a mentor anymore. have a mentor and that camaraderie of other beekeepers to kind of Go back and forth and discuss. There's a, an old adage we like to say, 10 beekeepers, 25 opinions. And that's okay. It's a healthy discourse as to what is going on. And you, you can also see if, uh, I like to say this a lot of times, so even though our intermediate beginners and seasons, if you are a beekeeper, 90% of us who would hear, at least in our Henderson County realm, in our world, and I'd say the Western North Carolina realm, is that 90% of us are on the same page. We adhere to certain practices that really benefit and make our job as beekeepers a little bit more manageable. The 10% is your methodology. And as a beak, you will establish that methodology. It's what you feel comfortable doing in what you've learned and garnered from everybody, whether it was a bee school. And I have to bring up bee school again, as a beak in Henderson County, you have the opportunity to take bee school ad nauseum in infinitum. And I have done it for 12 years. So you can only get better by understanding your skill set and craft over time, but also things do evolve and change. This is always in flux. What we knew five years ago isn't true anymore. What we knew 25 years ago isn't true anymore. Certain things are constants. If you read, read AJ Root, things about queens still occur. The X, y, A, B, C, X, Y, Z of beekeeping, written in the 1800s. So some of those things are still true. So uh, the third thing with regards Hold on to- Hold let me just oh. help people catch up with, you just threw a lot into the world right oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so number one, don't repeat mistakes. Number two, stay on top of new technology for beekeeping. And um, Antoine just gave us a, a nugget, um, the A, B, C, and X, Y, Z of bee culture by uh, Mr. Root. AJ Root. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then the other thing I want to just as an example to what you're saying. So my first year as a newbie, uh, five years ago, um, I was just following my mentor who said, feed your bees. And now, uh, uh, you know, as an intermediate beekeeper, uh, now I understand that you can overfeed to swarm. <laughs> exactly. So then you want to like, you don't want to overfeed because then you're going to actually cause a swarm. Okay. What's the number three uh, thing? So we've got don't repeat mistakes, stay on top of new technology for beekeeping. And then what's number three for our intermediate peeps? I'm going to quote one of our beekeepers within our club, 
It depends as a cause that catches many things. So like you were just saying, feeding, it depends. It's a, I like to call it a fine dance, a ballet, where the moves are just right, where you're walking that line of too much, too little, that in regard to feed, space in the colony, conditions around you, et cetera. So again, still being a good observer of those things, those elements that really we can't get a measure on per se, but start establishing a gut feeling for what is going on. So more intuitive, more so than practical skill set, but it incorporates the practical skill set. So I'm going to put via good. So it depends, catches a lot. Find out what's too much to litter for you and your hives. Be a good observer as a newbie. Um, trust your gut nice. instinct or your trust your in your intuition. Uh, that's so true, Antoine, because you know, uh, because everybody has uh different opinions as beekeepers sometimes you know you're going to be in a your apiary and what's going to work at historic johnson farms for example would i would observe when i would go back to my own apiary because the sun and the shade were different or the hydration would be different because my highs were near a small creek the laurel creek um it just wouldn't apply and so That's i'd exactly. have to trust and so I'd have this intuition and I would say to my husband, you know, I'm just going to try X, Y, Z. And then he's like, trust your gut, you know, and, and most of the time my gut instinct was right on. Occasionally it was terrible, but then you learn. Okay. So then what about advanced beekeepers, which I do not consider myself an advanced beekeeper. Um, so this is, you know, I'm looking forward to my future, um, creating a homestead, you know, outside into Lake Lure. I have one in East Flat Rock. But one reason why I volunteer, by the way, what, as a president, um, you know, staying closer to our seasoned beekeepers and being part of the club is it forces me to continue to learn. It's a great structure for me to like I, every time I go to another meeting, I hear something new. I've already heard something new in what Antoine has said today. So what about our advanced uh, beekeepers? What are the three for them? Okay, so now the advanced beekeepers are going to be looking at different things. So now this, they have a good understanding, comprehension of how their apiary works, how bees function. Granted, things still can happen. There's always variables out there that we have no control over. That might be the weather for, for affecting blossoms or nectar flows. So as an advanced beekeeper, we have to think about, okay, in my talks, we always talk about winter in, re in preparations for our bees. So it's always about winter. Here in North Carolina, especially in our particular region, we have a lot of microclimates in among our seasons. So as advanced beekeepers, we have to be in tune with how is the weather going to affect our nectar flow? Are we making preparations for a nectar flow that may fail? And if so, what are those preparations? There have been times where experienced beekeepers have had have lost the tulip poplar flow and we've had to feed our bees up until the sourwood flow came in and that wasn't too long ago we get tulip flows that have typically uh the old adage here or factual information is one in five years for tulip poplar in our region is a good year a fabulous year sometimes you can have a, an off year that is good too but then again there's no consistency because the weather is the variable secondly Okay. So, okay, um, the knowing that your bees swarm season can come upon us at any given time between March and October. So an experienced beekeeper has got, not only has he fine tuned his observation, but he's making inspections based upon his knowledge from previous seasons and keeping a journal, I find is very important to make sure you can document something that was really off or maybe a little bit of an anomaly for that season. So a journal is most important or some sort of record keeping in the colony or in the apiary. Um, that way, you know what's going on. And thirdly, having a plan for expansion or not, whether you want to grow your colonies to the point where it is not manageable or have out yards where you want to grow your, uh, your situation, your apiary into numerous yards. And we have beekeepers and I'll give some plods out there to people like David Stalling or Jim Poe in the backyard. You can go from two to a hundred hives in a season. 
If you are aggressive enough about splitting, again, as a seasoned beekeeper who knows what he's doing or she does what she's doing, the idea is to have a plan and whether that plan is to incorporate everything within your own yard or start expanding into other yards to know how to do that, but also understanding the management practice that you apply for two or four or six mm -hmm. or eight hives does not work when you're talking in 20, 30, and 40 hives. So for the advanced beekeepers, numbers make a difference in the way you stewardship these bees, the way you care for them, because it becomes a little bit precarious when you're out there and you know you've got six hives to go through today and make an inspection. But if you've got 60 hives, it takes on a whole different um, picture and, and you, a different kind of plan. So for the experienced beekeepers, understanding what expansion growth or not is all about, nectar flows and knowing what to do and how to do it and managing colony sizes and uh, understanding the seasons, how they play in that part and respecting those boundaries and knowing what to do when you have queen events at any odd time of the year. And that's why we always encourage senior beaks to know what they're doing, have a reserve colony or two in the form of nukes or, or, or resources that you can adapt to those conditions that come about. And that's a seasoned beekeeper's knowledge for you, that they know how to handle a problem. Um, so for example, I've had a colony where we had we have European hornets in our area, and they can devastate a colony. And European hornets are the ones people see that look like little serial numbers on the side of them. And they come around, they sound like hummingbirds. And if you're working a colony, the best way to shut down the colony and come back the next day, because they will notify their colonies, and they will come and descend upon the colony and gut it. In three or four days, you lose a colony. I've had that happen. A number of people have had it happen. And so you lose a queen at the end of September. You're, you're cooked. You really don't have a plan unless you have reserved colonies to borrow resources. So uh, one of the seasoned beekeeper skill sets is to merge colonies. We marry them with newspaper. And I've gone into winter with four deep colonies. And you split them back out in the spring. Again, these are practices that senior beekeepers know how to do in order to handle an event that may have come up and surprise you, something that wasn't planned for, because we have creatures that prey upon honeybees. And when that occurs, not only are the critters of the issue, when you have other insects that can feed upon your, your girls, you tend to be a little bit defensive. And I'm out there with a tennis racket, taking them down one at a time, but those girls can come back and each one of the European hornets goes back and they can become a queen. And it's, it's, not, it's not a pretty picture because they can, promulgate their population very comfortable. It's a really, can you just see uh, everybody who's made it this far into the interview that this type of, you know, Antoine's experience can really benefit you. And so however you want to participate with the uh, Henderson County Beekeepers Association, I just want to, uh, we've got online resources like this. We also have uh, regular monthly meetings. We also have a speakers series. It's really robust. And uh, our, our current board of directors has a strong commitment to having really wonderful speakers uh, coming both in person, but then also available to us on Zoom. If this is of interest to you and you're not yet a member, you can become a member at hcbkeepers.org. And Antoine, in closing, you know, any like last bits of advice or maybe just like what does the future of our apiary look like? Well, uh, for the plans for the future, we are actually doing some interesting things right now. We are in uh, conjunction with Carl Chesick up at the Honey Bay Bee Research Center. We're going to participate in a study uh, regarding mite populations within colonies. And so we have a theoretical uh, approach. We're going to do something, and the team that we've gathered together is going to do some sampling. So that's something coming up. We try to keep it exciting and adventurous. Uh, which sometimes can be really precarious at that, but it enters some in the sense that we have single deep management right now, which is for an advanced beekeeper where you can make honey production or brood production your goal for the season. And in single deep management, you can, if there's a sizable nectar flow, you can really make a lot of honey very quickly. And ways to work within those single deep managers is to, if you get, uh, because the management skills are required, once a week inspection from pretty much March through the end of October, that demands a lot. We have a team of people who are dedicated and that's wide open to our one plus year beekeepers in the club. and. Like you said, we well, try hold on. To I have a question about that. So then, Certainly. so you know, because I didn't even occur, that didn't even occur to me as a, like an opportunity for me. And now mm -hmm. that you're talking, 
um, you know, I have all I've always been interested in the single D management, mm -hmm. but I haven't been able to do it successfully on my own. And I currently don't have bees because mine absconded from my last mite treatment and mm -hmm. I decided um, like I would become president and then I would wait for the new homestead. So I'm sort of in between right now mm -hmm. uh, of my colonies. And so I'm really interested in maybe coming and learning more about the single uh, deep management. So how would I get inside that flow with you all about that? And maybe there are other people who are interested too. That's a very good question and you're more than welcome. And in, like I said, we encourage people who have at least one year's experience because they know what they're looking for on a frame. But we meet typically on Wednesdays and it's a... Oh. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a time of the week where uh, we are governed by a bunch of retirees. So we're really are retired. But if you have the time on what Wednesday, time of the, what time, like it, like uh, noon, it's like usually 10 30, 10 o'clock, 10 30, 11, depending on the weather. But summertime, we come in about 10 o'clock, a little in the cooler months now, we'll wait till about 11 ish. And we'll spend an hour, hour and a half in there, and we'll be doing our inspections. And well, or just so happens that on Wednesday, I'm coming home from teaching a fitness class. And I could from Fletcher, so I could like roll oh, by awesome. his Derek Johnson form sure. and then suit up real quick and then just be ready by 10 30. Yes. I may I may do that, Antoine. Good. Okay. You'll but if you're blast. interested in that, we need to really make sure that Antoine, like you're texting Antoine, making sure that it's okay and that they're actually meeting. You don't just want to show up for something like right. that. You want right. to make sure that the, the, there's actually somebody there to greet you, especially since his historic Johnson Farm has a different agenda they're doing tours and and teaching people about the history of the area so we also want to make sure that when you park we have to park in the uh front and then walk back you don't want to like go into the farm and then park in the back um that's really great Antoine and then for people who are new and they're still mm -hmm. under a year or they wouldn't be an advanced beekeeper to you know participate in that or an intermediate uh, beekeeper for that, then it's usually Saturdays or how do they find out about, you know, right. other than the- like yeah, So everyone would be, everyone is really welcome to come out to the apiary but every time we are out there functioning. So it, there, this is not a barred close. It's just that the people who are actually in there, we have a tight space for the single lead management. We want to make sure that those who are in there to, we don't want people fumbling around and, and on an established single deep, we have very little flexibility regarding sure. um, you know, ruining a queen, for example. But as far as the general apiary sessions, they're wide open to the club members. And I usually will post and in duplicate posts with email. Um, in, uh, and they're usually twice a month. Sometimes they'll be three times a month, depending on, on what we need to do. And uh, they'll bond up, they'll sometimes butt back to back on a weekend. So two Saturdays in a row, or sometimes every other Saturday. And we'll run those pretty much from, it depends on the weather here again. So latter part of March into April, pretty much straight on to the end of the year until we can't really go into the colonies. We don't want to chill the brood because if we're out there and it's 55 degrees and beautiful sunny, but there's a wind blowing, it's not really ideal because that will kill bees. But Everyone is well. their development. Remember, we exactly. had a year coming. Like, get, we were all like horrified. And she was giving us like threshold. And we were all like, oh my God. And, like, and she was like, yes. no, it really needs to be higher than that. And we we're just all like, oh my God. So uh, if you're interested in that and you're confused about where to go to get that information, you can always email me at president at hcbkeepers.org. And let's say that you're watching this maybe you know, 2027, and I'm no longer president, that email address will still reach the current president. So president at hcbkeepers.org. And thank you so much for your time today, Antoine. You're more than welcome, Michelle. And thank you for being our president and making our organization that much better. Uh, we are a good group of people. And this club has a wealth, I would guess, somewhere around 300 uh, not to use the term loosely, but man or woman years combined with all the yes. number of people. So we have a, we beekeepers will talk your ear off for days, months, years. When, when you get into As a evidenced room, by this yeah, interview. Yeah. It's a universal language, just like any other skill set or craft, no matter where you are in the world, 
language doesn't, it kind of drops by the wayside because you both understand or the persons involved understand what's going on. So it's been a pleasure discussing this with you and sharing this with all our beekeeper and the network of beekeepers out there who observe this video. And we look forward to having you participate in the club, being part of the apiary and all the other functions that go on throughout the year. You can step up and believe it or not, you first year beekeepers, as, as little as you think you know, you have so much knowledge that you can share and impart to others that you would be surprised. Always remember, you've got more you than you think you do. Thanks. That's so great, Antoine. And just like Antoine said, if you're out there and you're wanting to be a beekeeper, jump right in. Don't wait. I hear so many beekeepers or want to be beekeepers like, oh, it's just not the right time or some other excuse. Um, but life is precious. And so if you're at all interested, do B school, get started, find a mentor, go work at somebody's local apiary at the very least. It's a really beautiful and wonderful thing. Um, you can also locally here, we've got festivals coming up. And if you would like to, or maybe do some outreach with some educational opportunities and some students and whatnot. Another thing that's really special is sharing the knowledge and the passion that you have for our pollinators with other people, children and other families, churches, um, different type of um, marches and, and festivals, farmers markets and whatnot. People really can come together and unite around our pollinators because guess what? They're the reason we have most of the fruits and vegetables that we love to eat. So it's always a unifying topic. If you need anything, please reach out. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.